Hello everyone, my name is Zach and welcome to another uh another part of our uh um uh, what I call the writer's workshop series. This is a part of a series that I am gonna be analyzing and discussing my own creative work. I'm trying to like pull up my uh, stream so that I can watch it. There we go. So, okay, I'm muting you. Uh, I don't have an easy option to uh watch, uh, monitor my live stream just to see like if anyone messages me and chat. Uh, so if someone does message me, I have to have the stream pulled up on my phone, right here. And I just had to monitor chat that way. Like, there's no way for me to just have like Twitch chat pulled up while also having my project pulled up. In this stream, we're going to be continuing reading the creative work of my ma recently published master's project. And if you want to read this for yourself, I'm just going to go ahead and show this off real quick. They did actually kind of publish uh, some more uh, stuff at. Uh, uh, on my uh, scholar work, so it's a little bit harder to find because I'm not at the top of the list anymore My project's not at the top of the list anymore But if you google Chico State Scholar Works, C-H-I-C-O S-T-A-T-E Scholar Works You uh, search that, this top option should be Miriam Library CSU Chico, you click that Click visit Chico Scholar Works and all you have to do is Google my name, Zachary Bennett, Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y-B-E-N-N-E-T-T. -T. Search that. And the only option that should pop up is my uh, project. Before we get things started, I do have something I want to just state right here for legal purposes. This does have a publication uh, uh, warning. Uh, so, uh... Basically, it says that this cannot be reprinted or reproduced in any manner acceptable to the usable, uh, usual copyright restrictions. Got the written permission of the author. Technically, what I am doing is reproducing this project by showing it on uh, YouTube and Twitch. I am the author of this project. I wrote this project so I gave myself full permission to discuss and analyze this creative work. In the meantime, I believe that I was on page 51. If I remember correctly. So before we get things started, we are going to be getting ourselves introduced uh, to the character of Michael. Michael is a character from the Bible. He's one of the major archangels, especially the leading archangels in the uh, Bible. Uh, my role of him in the story is actually a little bit different, as you will soon see. He's kind of, he's not really presented as an antagonist. More so presented as someone that is showing doubts of this, his role in a certain group that is an antagonist of force in the story. And uh, throughout, and later on in the story, like he does, in fact, I don't think, even think that I show it because I think I had to cut that out uh, when I published this. But uh, he does eventually kind of have a change of heart and he does leave the organization to uh, kind of it's just because of his own like, moral thing and Michael is essentially like the character that's essentially more more the concept of the morals he uh he always does what he thinks is is right and he in initially joined this antagonist group the primal order because he thought that their goals were just and it was only as they started like getting more desperate towards uh creating like their uh to achieving their goals did he start to have like second thoughts and started to realize that he was maybe wrong and uh and uh, uh he was gonna be wrong in uh, aligning himself with him and another thing this also references uh plot lines from book one it m mentions the antagonist spade who is a main antagonist in book one um i will make note of any information that what that uh would be important to take note of as I read this uh, thing as it relates to book one but uh, for the most part you should be able to read uh, this section without without like having to need like book one that's actually how, how I've kind of designed this 
uh, Michael. Michael sat, sat in a large room surrounded by five other figures. All six of them made up the secret organization of heaven known only as the Primal Order. This organization has spies everywhere and excelled in information gathering. At one point, they had controlled what went on within heaven through their subtle actions. Now they have been struggling ever since Alec Lowe began his work as a Hyde agent to investigate a notorious villain named, named Spade. The events that followed led to most of, the, of heaven gaining knowledge of the Primal Order, and the one secret organization was exposed to the light. Michael gazed towards the center of the room where a monitor uh, uh, stood that once displayed the scarred visage, visage of Hefe, who had a bored look on his face. At one point, Michael viewed that uh, dealing with demons was necessary, but for the first time, he had begun uh, feeling doubts of the Primal Order's goals. Michael felt sick whenever he witnessed his companions make shady deals with demons. Michael knew the end goal too well, but he found himself questioning if he wanted to go through with it. The only member that had a vested interest in what Hefe had to say was the leader, a tall, thin man with short red hair, who was once his close friend Simon. To his left, Simon's uh, to hit. That's a typo. Uh, to his left, as uh, I think it's supposed to be to Simon's left, sat a uh, small, petite, tan woman, withered with age, a rarity for heaven. This woman held the position of chief of staff, and every spy, every member that had any information of worth, reported directly to her. These three figures represented the pinnacle of command and respect from within the Primal Order, as there were very few that dared to defy them. So there's one other thing I will say is, uh, initially, like, if you were, if the, my first book was finished and published, it's out there right now, the Primal Order was largely kind of steeped in mystery. Like, there's a, for most of the story, there was only, like, three main figures as uh, seen. Uh, uh, within uh, for most of the book one, and those three figures are Michael, Simon the leader, and his chief of staff, which who is named Maria, and I don't know if I named her in this section. Uh, Maria was actually someone that I actually kind of coined the name in uh, this uh, in this project. She didn't really have a name at the time I wrote uh, book one at the time my current draft of book one. Uh, but I actually f further developed her character, and she's actually kind of more of an interesting character uh, since I actually uh, developed her in book one. And uh, you'll actually kind of see a little bit more into uh, like who these characters are, what their as what their uh, goals are as we continue reading this. There's one other thing I will say is Simon's name, uh, the leader of the Primal Order, Simon. His name wasn't initially Simon in the initial draft. I was actually going to name him Camael, C-A-M-A-E-L, which was named after one of the angels in the Bible, which was a name he actually chose for himself, I believe. But I realized that Camael was a name that was very similar to Samael, which is the name of the devil in uh, the Bible. And uh, I kind of had to change it to be uh, something else so it won't confuse a reader. But that's kind of like his origin beyond his name. But Simon uh, or Camille, his name was first introduced in book two, uh, and I didn't really fully develop him until after this project was finished and published when I sat down and I finished the first draft of book one. Hefe spoke up, growing impatient with the game of cat and mouse they had been playing. I don't know what more you want from me, Simon. He spoke the name with a tone of spite and hatred as if he spat it out of his mouth. I told you I would handle Alec Lowe. The red-haired man, Simon, responded, I asked you to kill Alec Lowe. I know your man has contacted, contacted Alec. Why isn't he dead? Tefe gave a sly grin that filled Simon with unease. You need to trust that I will get the job done. Michael knew that Simon did not like dealing with demons. In Simon's eyes, there was never a good demon. They all had their own ulterior motives. I find it hard to trust someone like you. Simon growled. Hefe's eyes narrowed as he had a uh, look of mild annoyance at Simon's response. If you don't trust me, that is your problem. Alec will be taken care of. I am a demon of my word. The call ended as the room sat in silence. Eventually, a man below the leading three members spoke up. 
Well, that was eventful, but what's gonna happen now? Simon spoke up, calm and collected. Now we wait. Alec Lowe will be killed either by Hefe's hand or our own. Alec remains to be the only threat to our organization. Once Alec is taken care of, we can begin work on our goal, creating the apocalypse on our terms. Balance will be achieved one way or another. The room sat in silence as Michael stared off in the distance. Control had been the one thing the Primal Order excelled at, and since Alec exposed the Primal Order to heaven, they had lost that control. The longer Michael remained in the organization, the more he saw Simon's mind begin to fall into chaos. The Michael joined us because he had sympathy for Samael, the devil, someone Michael viewed was like a brother to him. Samael's defeat a thousand years ago when he tried to create the apocalypse was eye-opening to Michael. He aligned himself with Simon because of that event. Where at one point he viewed that the apocalypse, where at one point he viewed that the apocalypse was necessary. As he saw Simon grow more desperate and angrier, he now began to wonder about the cost. Michael was powerless when Jacob Lohat was sent to purgatory. He was powerless several months ago when one of his close friends was killed for investigating Jacob's disappearance. Every single time a decision was made, his vote often seemed to be the only one against it. Simon believed that the apocalypse would happen soon, and if nothing is done, the primal order will be the, would be the ones to do it. So, this is also something that has changed since I developed this project. In this story, and what's published right now, Michael's goals or role in the story is kind of like, he's sort of like a passive observer and only really kind of makes a move to kind of leave the organization later on in the story. But... I do kind of change his role in uh, book one where he kind of focuses both on the concept of the theme of family, which will be the main theme of book one. But through him, I'm also using it to analyze the role, the, I, the theme of dreams and the concept that some dreams may be too dangerous to pursue. And he is analyzing that theme through the actions of Simon. And this is something that won't be made apparent in here, but when I come to revise this project, when develop, when I come to de develop book two, uh, after book one is published, uh, I will be trying to make sure those themes are still prevalent in the story. Simon and Michael are kind of meant to be like a contradictory, like parallels of one another. Uh, Simon is motivated to achieving his goals, like no matter what the cost. And Michael is kind of the moral contrast to that. He was presented in a way where he was at first motivated to assist, to make sure that Simon's goals come true, but in the end, he ended up like having his own doubts and wants to like do something that he wants to actually pursue, like his own. Uh, one uh, kind of has a moral uh question, like his own morality, and kind of wants to like leave it because he doesn't fully believe that the problem orders goals were just anymore. Uh, when I develop this project, when I expand on this project, and and developing book two, Michael will continue to analyze one of the themes of family in relation to how he views the character of God and how he reflects on the role of Samael in the story. And also in his uh, view of dreams and how uh, Simon is essentially been kind of so desperate to achieve his dreams that he has been kind of blind as, as to the cost. And that's kind of like the uh, the things I kind of want Michael to focus on when I come to revising this thing. It's kind of one of the things that I think is kind of lacking in the story. If I actually focus on the concept of the themes that are present in book one and just kind of expand on it in here, then the story may actually be better. But as of right now, like the only themes you could argue this story has is the concept of morality of good and evil. And of... Uh, and uh, really the concept of morality, of uh, right and wrong, and of uh, uh, good and evil. And that's not the themes that I kind of want to be focused on in this story. The themes that are kind of be, that's going to be prevalent in book one is the themes of the importance of family, of the importance of self-improvement, and the importance of having dreams and ambitions.
those are the three themes that I want to be uh, focused on in book one and throughout the first trilogy. And that's something that I should have made uh, clear in this project. And I think that if I did that, the story would actually be a little bit better. But as of right now, it doesn't really have that, uh, those themes, and it just kind of feels lacking in comparison. Alec returned to see, uh, Alec Lowe. Alec returned to see a group of three familiar figures standing next to, Al to Hugo. Alec recognized them as Charlotte Matthews and her companions. Uh, I don't actually name her companions in this section, at least I don't think so, but, uh, I will name them as we continue uh, reading uh, when we see them more but i i don't think i kind of gave them names in uh this project i actually didn't really name them until i started developing uh the first uh my uh fin until, until i finished the first draft of my first book uh charlotte wore a white shirt jean shorts and tennis shoes she had blonde hair with pink highlights and bright green eyes her hands were bandaged with the type of wraps attributed to a boxer. The wraps themselves were speckled with dry blood. Charlotte always ha held a strong appearance, and Alec knew he could trust her to save his granddaughter. Alec smiled after seeing them, but a part of him uh, wished he, he would be the one to find Elizabeth. She was his great-granddaughter, and he couldn't help but feel that the responsibility for a rescue should have fallen to him. Family was more important to Alec than even his life. But he knew upon looking at how Charlotte and her group held themselves, Elizabeth would be in good hands. Alec withdrew his wallet to examine the picture of his son and a thought entered his mind. Now there are two family members that needed to be saved. Alec approached Charlotte with a, sh a smile on his face. Charlotte, thank you for agreeing to find my granddaughter. Charlotte lightly punched Alec's shoulder. I know how important family is to you, Alec. Don't worry, I will find her. A tall man behind uh, Charlotte spoke up. He had wavy brown hair and blue eyes. He wore a burgundy sweater with brown slacks in, in his hands and held a tall hollow staff with holes pierced to the sides. So this is something that actually did change uh, within um, within uh, first draft. Uh, in my in my develop when I developed his character in uh, book one. He is actually the, he actually has a name uh his name is actually Flynn in uh, book one and he always wears a salmon like a pink colored suit and uh, he is essentially kind of meant to be the more charismatic of the uh of the group uh he is he and the other member of Charlotte's uh, posse I guess you could say are kind of meant to uh, are kind of more viewed favorably among the Hyde agency charlotte in my story is meant to be like more controversial among the Hyde agents because of how, how who her personality is she is extremely reckless she's kind of prone to bursts of anger she is just kind of more emotional and because of that like she kind of gets a lot of hate within the Hyde agency and meanwhile flynn uh, the tall man behind Charlotte and the other person who we, have just, who we haven't seen yet, who is named Frankie, are kind of viewed more favorably and they're kind of liked more among the Hyde agents. But uh, the, his design is actually kind of changed in uh, book one. Like he is not wearing a, he doesn't wear a burgundy sweater and brown slacks. He uh, wears a, a salmon colored suit. Uh, and if we find that guy that took Elizabeth, I'm sure Charlotte would like to be some sense into him. Charlotte popped her knuckles and then her neck. I hope we do because I'm really itching for a fight. This is something that I'm trying to do within my uh, project. For each of the main characters, uh, they do kind of have their own catchphrases. Or like how DC and Marvel characters do. Some, some of the DC and Marvel heroes do have their own like catchphrases. Uh, like a most uh, the most uh, common thing that I can think of is the things from the Fantastic Four, it's clobbering time, or Hulk, uh, Hulk smash. Uh, this is something I kind of want to try and do, where to try and make these characters more distinct, where uh, each of the main characters do have their own like catchphrases that they frequently use in certain situations. Charlotte Matthews, her catchphrase is "I am really itching for a fight." Alec Lowe's catchphrase that I don't know if you will see here is uh, laugh it up. 
Oftentimes, like, he'll encounter situations where people kind of mock him or uh, kind of laugh at him at his kind of feelings or something. And Alec will just simply say, laugh it up. That's, uh, those are catchphrases I'm trying to make present within these characters. It's something I want to make them stand out and kind of be more memorable to the reader. At this point, the there are going to be four trilogies in my story and one final book that is kind of meant to kind of wrap up the... Uh, Lingram plot lines of my story. Uh, at this point, the first three characters do have their own catchphrases. The fourth character and really like the fifth character of my uh, series, they don't really have their own catchphrases yet, but they will when I further develop them. Charlotte opened a portal and the three passed through, leaving Alec alone with Hugo. So it doesn't look like that I kind of mentioned the uh, third character uh, that is with Charlotte. Uh, the third character that is kind of within Charlotte's posse is uh, named Frankie. He is kind of a shorter character. He's kind of meant to be the jokester of the group. He kind of... Uh, he kind of focuses on making jokes and trying to like lighten the mood among his uh, peers. I actually kind of have like a very funny moment uh, when, I'm, when I'm ready to develop Charlotte's trilogy uh, where a lot of times like you'll see like Frankie just experimenting with different jokes. I actually kind of have a funny scene that I planned out where he kind of discovers a concept of dad jokes and he just kind of has fun just kind of incorporating that into like the dialogue and he just kind of he just is meant to be like the comedic thing but he's also going to be like the most compassionate He's sort of like they're going to be the glue that kind of holds the group together. And really, Frankie as a character is going to be the one that's going to be instrumental towards getting Charlotte what she wants the most, which is to be accepted by her peers and her family. Frankie will be the one that essentially works to make that happen. And it's because of his influence within the Hyde Agency and essentially, like, his compassion for his uh, friends that just kind of is in instrumental for that to happen. And he's really going to be, like, the, probably the most liked character of Charlotte's trilogy because of how, who his personality is. I can see a lot of people liking Frankie as a character, and I, I, I would have loved to have been able to kind of show their characters, uh, both of those characters, in this, uh, in this uh, scene, but I, I either had it at one point or I cut it out. Or I just didn't have it at all. But if you were, when they are seen in book one, all three characters are seen and they all do have their own lines and dialogue. But unfortunately, I don't uh, have. Uh, it looks like I only have uh, Flynn and Charlotte have lines, and Frankie is just like a passive observer, which is kind of a disappointment because I kind of really like the concept of Frankie, and I think I would have a lot of fun writing writing dialogue for him. But oh well. Charlotte opened a portal and the three passed through, leaving Alec alone with Hugo. Alec chuckled, himself at, at, chuckled to himself after seeing Charlotte once again. She seemed to be the type of person who fought first and asked questions later. Though this concept briefly made Alec worry, he knew that she was an S-Class agent and there were nothing to scoff at. S-Class was one of the highest classifications of Hyde agents, the type of people who always got the job done, no matter what. Excuse me. They were often tasked with the most dangerous missions and often excelled in rough situations. Alec was classified as C-Class. This has kind of changed recently. Like, I decided that after the end of book one, uh, he is uh, essentially going to be promoted and instead of C-Class, is going to be B-Class. Uh, I kind of made that decision, like, after I kind of was finishing the first draft of my book, but... I didn't really kind of make that uh, change in this story because I haven't finished the first chapter at the time when I was writing this. Alec was classified as a C-Class, one of the lowest ranks of Hyde. Though his success in his investigation into Spade has had proven his strength and adaptability. Hey, Charlie Boo! Uh, Hugo turned to Alec. I'm assuming you have more information into that cult. Alec nodded his head in confirmation. There are rumors that they have a location based in an estate in a small coastal, coastal town in California. I'm heading back to meet with Beckett to head out in to investigate. Hugo gave Alec a look of concern. Since they are referring to themselves as a church, be careful of any human elements. 
Remember, Hyde always operates from uh, the shadows. Do not expose the actions of that agency to humanity. I'm doing well, Charlie Boo. I'm just uh, a little bit still in the process of waking up. I uh, uh, kind of had a hard time sleeping last night. Uh, again, like I actually have a doctor's appointment next week, and I'm hoping I can get like an increase in the dosage of my medications to make sleeping easier. But I'm just uh, a little bit tired. It all really depends on Beckett and the possible demons I encounter. Hugo shook his head. If ba Beckett or any demon either threatens your safety or tries to expose you, isolate yourself. Play things smart. Bluff. Do anything besides using the power of uh, light in the pro presence of humanity. You were lucky in your first investigation where you had only a few missions involving humanity, but things may be different now that you are investigating the cult. Human humans are prone to believe in anything. I guarantee you there will be many humans intersected with this cult. Do not expose yourself. How's your project going? Uh, I am about 25% through the second round revisions. I actually haven't been able to like sit down and work on it uh, for a couple days now, mainly because I uh, I've been kind of having a hard time sleeping. Uh, but I'm and it's also kind of chaotic at home right now. Uh, we have people over that are kind of renovating the uh, house. Uh, we're kind of people that are going to be kind of sitting down at the laminate, laminated laminated uh, cabinets and going to be repainting it. So there's we have people over that's kind of like working to renovate the house essentially, and uh, so it's kind of like chaotic at home now. But uh, hopefully, when this project when they are done, like I'll kind of be more focused on uh, uh, focusing on my project. Uh, I don't think it's gonna take me too long to get through the second round of revisions. It's just uh, kind of taking a little bit more time than I would like, man, because it's just so distracting right now. I look open a portal as he pa and uttered as he passed through. All right, Hugo, I promise. I look arrived at Elizabeth's wrecked house to find Beckett leaning against a wa the wall with a look of pure boredom on his face. I look was surprised to see that Beckett had been waiting, and he felt bad that he took his time to do his research. Beckett noticed Alec and stood up. He held something in his hand, a torn picture of him when he was alive. It depicted Beckett with his wife and daughter. Beckett quickly set the picture in his pocket and crossed his arms. He knew Beckett's family well. Uh, I should clarify this is kind of like a odd sentence, uh, but it's, it may be obvious to some, but it's Alec knew Beckett's family well. He made it a habit to support his family after he exposed Beckett's actions. He gave them financial support and helped uh, put uh, Beckett's daughter in a good school. Most importantly, he knew where they were at this time, and even if Becca didn't want to hear it, he should know their status. You know, Alec droned, your family is in heaven now. I can give them a message if you want. A scowl formed on Becca's face. If I wanted to tell my family something, I would tell them myself, and I trust a traitor to deliver the message for me. Alec released a slight chuckle. Traitor? That's funny. You were the one who made deals with the mafia and abused your power as a police detective. Beckett pinned Alec to the wall and drew close to Alec, breathing his rancid breath in Alec's face. I did what I had to do to support my family. I wanted to put my daughter into the best school around. I wanted to buy my wife whatever she wanted. And I wanted to make sure that, they, that we were protected from anything that could go wrong in our life. Working as a detective pays nothing. I had to bend the rules. Alec shoved uh, Beckett back and withdrew a fast from his pocket and took a drink. We all have things we are fighting for. Despite our clashing personalities, I think I understand what you are fighting for. The difference between you and me is that I am not willing to bend or break the rules to get what I want. Becca scoffed at the idea. See how far you can get by see how far you can actually go by following the rules. You won't be able to win against primal order by playing things by the book. Did you look into my information? Alex spoke up after a brief moment of silence. I did find that your information of the Dem demonic church of the Mother of All does have some basis. There are different locations scattered throughout the world, and rather than tackling the largest ones, which will likely have the highest concentration of demonic and human activity, I have decided to tackle one of the smaller branches. We are going to an estate found in the coastal town of Rockley, California. I look open a portal and gesture Becca to follow. Becca uh, shook his head in response. I would rather avoid any contact with the power of light. 
I prefer to use the power of darkness to travel instead. Becca walked over to the corner of the room where a small shadow was present and stepped into it. He smiled a bit at Alec and waved goodbye as a cloud of black smog erupted from the shadows of the ground and enveloped his body. Swirls of darkness uh, spun rapidly around Becca, completely masking any human shape he once had. After about 20 seconds, the black mist began to lower, sinking back uh, down to, to be one of the sh with the shadow of the room. When it had settled, Becca was gone, disappeared into the darkness. A chill ran up Alex's spine. He had never seen something like that before, and he was reminded of his encounter with one of Spade's underlings, Fox, who was able to move incredibly fast by seemingly warping from place to place within total darkness. Alex suspended his disbelief and passed through the portal. For the first time, curi somewhat curious to see what Becca was capable of with his new abilities. There's something I do want to address, which is my goal with Beckett and Alec. They kind of have similar dreams where they kind of both in some ways want to reunite with reunite their family. Alec wants to bring kind of bring Jacob, uh, his son Jacob, back from uh, with to heaven. Who and Jacob is actually kind of trapped in purgatory. I feel very, I feel happy to hear about this project. I was very interested in working on it for you. Uh yeah, and again, like I'm sorry that I, uh, I kind of I felt like I was leading you on, but I was just I wasn't really I was kind of considering my options at the time. But for us, it's not in my destiny to work with you on this amazing project. Maybe you think someone is better or sweeter than me. It's kind of complicated. I am, was considering all my options I had at the time, and I ended up deciding to go with a different person. It's not meant to be a slide towards you. It's just kind of how things go. It's just typically how, what life is. Like, it's just... Not meant to. I'm sure you are a talented artist. I'm sure you're. Uh, uh, I'm sure you're good at line editing, which is what I was. We were discussing uh, on Discord, but I found someone better and found someone that I would want to work with more. And it's not meant to be a slide towards you. It's just uh, kind of how things go. And I'm sorry you were disappointed, but it's not meant to be a slide. And I would probably. Still be willing to work with you when de in developing my uh, website, but at this point, I want to make sure that my first book is in a good spot and is ready to be published and all the edits are finalized. And uh, I don't want to, like, I'd rather focus on one project at a time. So I'm not going to look towards uh, creating a website at this point, but I may look into it when my book is finished. gonna say that uh alec and levi beckett are kind of meant to be like parallels from each other they're both kind of have similar goals alec wants to uh reunite his family by saving his son jacob from his uh, life in purgatory and bringing him back into heaven levi beckett wants to reunite his family and actually kind of go to heaven and uh and uh kind of be with his family but the way that they are both going after that is kind of a little bit different uh beckett uh has a misguided belief uh of how he would uh go into heaven and there's one of the things that i want to focus on when developing this project this when i get to finishing when i get to writing this developing this project into book two is sort of like the dichotomy between Alec and Levi Beckett and how they're essentially two sides of the same coin. But how I'm handling Beckett as an antagonist is actually going to be a little bit different than someone would think. He stands to be one, um, he would stand to be one of my greatest antagonists of the series. 
mainly because of how developed he would be by the end of this uh, book. And he is someone that I will be kind of introducing and working with in the future of the series after this book is finished. But uh, he, uh, he's, he and Levi Beckett are kind of meant to be like uh, parallels of one another. Uh, very distracted right now. Alec arrived at a large estate in the coastal town of Rocky, California, with Beckett nowhere in sight. While Alec waited, he withdrew a small wooden pipe filled with tobacco and began smoking it. Alec started this habit as a, as a detective when he was alive, and he always felt some sort of comfort from smoking it. Alec was happy that the upside of being an angel of heaven It's too late to give me this project, Charlie Boom, because I already am committed with the other, uh, with this other person that I'm working with, and I don't want to work with you for uh, sending my draft to you to do the line editing. It's just really kind of frustrating at this point to just keep on pushing towards something when I already said no. Just please respect my decision. Where was I? Alex started this habit as a detective when he was alive, and he always felt some sort of comfort from smoking it. From smoking. Alex was happy that the upside of being an angel of heaven is that you do not have to worry about diseases like cancer creating no risk of uh, smoking tobacco. As Alex smoked, he absorbed, absorbed the estate and began to form a plan for how to go forward. The manor was a large white building with a black roof. It had a large driveway with about 10 cars parked inside and was surrounded by a freshly trimmed lawn. The property was bordered by a large hedge that rested on top of a red brick, brick panner. In the window, Alec spotted a single face watching him, and Alec suspected that one of the demonic residents knew that he was an agent. Heavy footsteps sounded behind Alec, causing him to turn around. From the shadows of the wall of hedges, Beckett approached Alec with a swagger. He had a grin on his face as he stopped at Alec's eye to gaze at the house. Alec could tell Beckett was enjoying himself. Alec suspected that uh, this may be the first time Beckett had worked alongside a hide agent and not working against one. Alex still had no idea what uh, Beckett's game was. Questions began to circle in his mind. What does he want? Can I actually trust him? Roby, this is going to be fun. Beckett chuckled as he took a step forward. Alex grabbed Beckett's arm to force him to turn, turn and look at Alec. We are not here for fun. We are here to work. Another thing, there may be humans alongside demons in there, so do what I say and do not attack unless we are able to separate ourselves from humans. Becca scoffed at the idea. Pfft, you're the boss, so what do you suggest? Alec withdrew a small pocket watch at his version of a cloak, a device meant to shroud the activities of, of a hide agent from humanity. The cloak made them invisible to the naked eye and allowed them to uh, pass through solid objects like doors and walls. The de this device made it a necessity for hide agents to operate in secrecy. However, it had one flaw. Anyone who was demonic or an angelic in origin was unaffected by the abilities of the cloak. Alec pressed a button at the top of the pocket watch. Stay close to me. The cloak activated covering uh, both Alec and Beckett as in the two began their approach to the front door. Occasionally Beckett will lie too far behind or stray too far forward. And Alec, I respect your decision and I hope your project will be completed soon and you will be successful. However, if you ever need my help, just let me know. All right. And I'll like, uh, occasionally Be Beckett will lag too far behind and straight too far forward and Alec would need to quickly correct him. It was clear to Alec that Beckett did not like staying in close, uh, in close proximity to him, but there was no other option. The two arrived at the front door and passed right through only to see a group of hooded figures kneeling in front of a large of a portrait of a woman with white skin, black eyes, and hair that appeared to be on fire. Alec was stunned. Is that really what Lilith looks like? Becca released a small laugh. No, it is what humans think she looks like. No one I know of in hell has physically seen her. However, we do at times hear her. Lilith resides in, within the, 
uh, within the darkness of every resident of hell. And they are trained early on to ignore the temptation she offers, but those that don't lose themselves. So before I go on, uh, I think I mentioned this in the last uh, last stream. Lilith is, I believe, taken from either Judaism or Catholicism. I think it's the, she was in both. She was the first woman that God created alongside Adam. But she essentially did not, she was essentially kind of banished uh, because she would not, as bad as it sounds, is actually kind of the reason why she was banished. But she did was not really complying to what Adam wanted. She was essentially kind of described as kind of sort of like independent or whatever. And uh, she was banished for that. It's kind of like a really kind of fucked up thing. But like, uh, unfortunately, like a, lot, a lot of the Bible is kind of like misogynistic. Where, uh, in in the view of women in the Bible, like a large lar lot of the views of women in the Bible is kind of meant to be subservient to man, which is kind of really kind of fucked up. But it's kind of like true of how the Bible was written, uh, and so that's really kind of the reason why Lilith was kind of banished. But in different sources, she is described as like the first demon, and uh. How I'm basically going to be handling her character in this project when she, when I develop this project into the second book, she's going to be a part of an experiment within, uh, within this uh, project, which in different parts of this project, she's going to be kind of instrumental in me kind of uh, experimenting with developing like two characters in one. And I kind of do this with, uh, and the part that was kind of cut out from this project in relation to Hefe, and I'm planning on doing this throughout part two, and I'm going to be doing this one more time in part three, and develop this into book uh, two. Uh, but she's kind of going to be kind of an interesting character, and she will be referenced like later on in the story, but uh, she's kind of meant to be... Sort of like a more like intangible or like a like a like a sort of like a presence within demons, and but she's definitely kind of meant to be a, kind of more mysterious in this project. I look in back and spot someone making eye contact with them and quickly left the entry room they were in, causing the two to follow. I look activated the lights within his eyes to activate the power of flow. He saw a dark aura emanating from the figure, the power of darkness. Alec knew from looking at his entity that the figure was a Redemos. I think this is the first time, this is the second time I referenced Redemos in this project. As a reminder, Redemos is essentially a human that was sent to hell. And essentially uh, is uh, was exposed to the power of darkness. Uh, Redeemos is essentially like a human version of a demon. Demons are entities that are born in hell and are kind of have like no very little of the human traits that a uh, humanity is known for. But they're kind of both will be kind of like involved like in the concept of uh, morality that this uh, that this project, this larger uh, novel project, is going to be focusing on. Where this is something I kind of brought up and uh, kind of expanded on in book one. But basically my idea with Redeemers and Demons as a whole. Is my concept of my idea that I uh, introduced like in the midway through book one that I. Uh... Alright I see you Charlie Boo. My idea with uh, this uh, that I kind of introduced in book one is the concept that there are good and bad, uh, bad people on both sides of a conflict. And this kind of goes in hand to hand with my concept of morality, uh, where a demon or a redeemos is as equally capable of doing something good as they are of doing something bad. And the same is true for the angels or the agents present in my story, where they're equally as capable of doing something good as they are of doing something bad. And that's a topic of like uh, morality that I kind of want to focus on in my story. So uh, as so just uh, 
Just a quick reminder, Redeemus is like a human demon. A de human that was sent to hell was exposed to the darkness. As the two followed, Alec realized that the person was a young man. He reminded Alec of one of those young college students he would see when he was a detective. This has changed. He was a detective in Los Angeles, not New York. Uh, that's kind of like an old, uh, that's kind of something that I did change when I developed in this project. A time that felt so long ago to Alec. The Redeemers arrived at, at a wooden door sealed within an uh, electronic lock. He quickly keyed in the code in, into the keypad and entered, closing the door behind him. Alec and Becca passed through to find the Redeemers running through down a set of stairs, forcing Alec and Becca to chase after him. They chased the Redeemers through a wooden door but were greeted by a group of armed Redeemers armed, aiming a variety of weapons at Alec and Beckett. At the back of the room, behind a large desk, sat a man with a flannel shirt and jeans as he glared at both Beckett and Alec. He immediately recognized that Beckett was not an agent of Hyde and he had a look of pure disgust. Boy, the man groaned, the Hyde agency must be getting really desperate to hire the assistance of Redeemos. Either you must be the world's dumbest agent or the most reckless. Alec rolled his eyes at the insult. Laugh it up. I'm not working with Beckett by choice. So this is like the first instance of what I was discussing earlier about Alec and Charlotte and Matthews having their own catchphrases. This is Alec's catchphrase as a reminder. Laugh it up. The man's eyes grew wide and uh, the people standing behind... Be the man's eyes grew wide and the people standing by began to hesitate and started to lower their guns. Beckett. I know that name. Don't you work for... A gunshot echoed throughout the room as Beckett fired a pistol emanating a dark aura as he shot the man in the arm. Chaos erupted as a man screamed in pain. The guards opened fire at Alec and Beckett. Beckett charged his group while Alec turned around and flipped over a nearby table to use it as cover. Alec withdrew his revolver and fired at his group. He was aiming for their legs, but he found he missed a couple shots. He was not an expert marksman, but he was able to make do. One of the shots went through one of the Redeemos' upper thigh causing him to ball over in pain. Another shot pierced the Redeemers through the shoulder, causing him to clutch it in pain. All the while, bullets uh, being fired uh, were piercing through the table, with one of the shots winging his left arm. Alec knew he had to do something to wrap this up, otherwise he would die. Alec activated the flow in his eyes, and he knew that he, this would be a gamble and he needed to act fast. Flo only had a chance to predict the uh, enemy's movements, and when firearms were involved, the uh, success rate was minimal. And so this is something I do want to kind of point out, like flow is one of the abilities of light that high agents use. It's essentially focusing like light within a certain body part or a certain point of an high agent and manipulating the effects. For example, like uh, a uh, high agents can like focus flow into like the muscles of their legs. To kind of make them like run faster or kind of jump or uh, farther or whatever. But if they, but high agents are typically taught to kind of focus it in their eyes, which kind of allows them to kind of predict the enemy movements for like a short period of time. Of the five guards that were firing at Alec, only one shot he was able to predict. Alec quickly shot the guards, one he shot in the head, blood spraying out, spraying out across the wall. Then another shot in the hand, for, causing the guard to drop the gun. Alec could see that the white, white of his bones was exposed through his hand. Alec shot the other three in the chest, but only one was still breathing. One got shot in the heart, and the other in the lung. One died instantaneously, the other slowly drowned in his own blood. Alec touched his wet side, wet with blood, as a couple of bullets hit him. He would need some time to recuperate after he returned to the cottage. With that, Redeemos Alec fought taken care of, he turned around and watched Beckett as he was gouging out the eyes of the last Redeemos with his thumbs. The others that Beckett fought lay in a puddle of their own blood with a mangled mess. Alec looked at the people he fought. They were hurt, but they were still alive. Alec felt sorry for the ones Beckett fought, as though they were Redeemos, they did not deserve to go out that way. Alec withdrew a, small, a few small metal discs as he threw them at each one of the Redeemos he inca incapacitated. They erupted in a bright white light as they were transported to the Hyde Agency's prison known as a Citadel. Even though a Hyde Agent was trained to fight demonic entities, they often focused on capturing them rather than to kill them. Alec gave Be Beckett a somber look as he turned to, to the apparent leader of the gang. 
What do you know the prim pr about the Primal Order? The man was short of breath, clutching his arm. The Primal Order? Who? I have no idea who that is. I would slam his hands on the desk. Don't lie to me. I know this church has ties to the Primal Order. What do you know about them? The man stammered. I, I, I don't know. I don't even burn this place. Matthias does. But he left for Las Vegas to go to a meeting for uh, the other bosses. If anyone know, would know, we would. They would. When is the meeting? The man exclaimed to Freer. Two days. The meeting is in two days at Caesar's Palace. I looked through a desk at the man sending him, uh, sending him. That's a typo. I don't know how I mistyped that. I looked through a desk at the man sending him to the Citadel and then turned to Beckett. Beckett, what the hell was that? Why did you shoot him? Beckett's marked. He would have revealed my employer and I'm not willing to show all my cards yet. You are not ready. Alec laughed. Ready? Ready for what? Beckett's eyes narrowed and for a moment he didn't say anything. He just silently walked over to where the boss was sitting and made a gesture with his hand. One thing. Does it not bother you that the Citadel is known as the largest presence in existence? Holding demons and redeemers that were captured and imprisoned throughout the past 1,500 years? Alex sighed. If you were to ask me a couple months ago, I would say no. Now I'm not so sure. Becca raised his eyebrows in interest. What changed? My last mission was eye-opening, and I made a promise I would try and change how the Hyde agency, Hyde agency operates, but I don't know how. I have a suggestion. Free every demon you are holding in the city and restore the leadership of hell, and that will fix everything. I looked down briefly before looking back uh, to look back in the eyes. I don't have the power to do something like that. And I feel releasing everyone from the Citadel will cause us more problems. This is a problem I need to figure out in time. They can laugh. Don't sit on this idea for too long. Time has a habit of changing people. Maybe you aren't a lost cause after all. See you in two days, Boy Scout. Becca walked into a nearby shadow, causing him to disappear instantly, leaving Alec alone with his thoughts. Alec gazed around the room and looked, looking at the couple of dead redeemers, and blood splattered along the wall, and he began to feel guilty. When he first started going through the Hyde Academy, the idea of Hyde agents being good and residents of hell being bad was hammered in his mind early on. But was that really true? Were the demons and redeemers bad because the Hyde agency said they were bad? Or were they bad because of the Hyde Agency? Alec recalled what he experienced in Purgatory, of the seemingly endless war between the deceased agents, Hyde Agents and the Demons of Hell. The battle was often weighted in the agent's favor, but from what Spade told him a couple months ago, the Demons of Hell were desperate. They had no one to lead them, no one to help them control their abilities, and because of that, they were in a fight-or-flight situation. In this first combat scenario since Alec defeated Spade, he was no longer sure if he was on the right side. For the first time, Alec Lowe was scared. So I do, I'm going to be ending it off with this section with Elizabeth Hart, but I do want to go back, this is on page 65, yes. I do want to go back to the uh, table of contents. I want a reminder of what we have going forward. So we have a Hefe section coming up. I know what that one is. I know what Michael is. Okay, so it looks like that I'm mainly just trying to get my mind uh trying to like get an understanding of what we have going forward, trying to remind myself what's coming. I actually know what's coming up now, looking at these entries. We're going to be stopping Elizabeth Hart next time we will be finishing uh, these four sections. They're actually kind of a long sections, uh, but we'll try and get through them next uh, next uh, week. Before we get things started, I do want to make a former uh, formal announcement with Elizabeth Hart. This is kind of a spoiler territory book one because it wasn't really kind of revealed until like in the second half of book one elizabeth has like a unique ability uh where she has a like a like an omniscient voice in her head named gray that kind of gives her advice and kind of so she kind of guides her into like a safety thing and this is something that will be kind of 
announced here, and I do kind of want to make a note of this. Elizabeth Hart is a Nephilim. She's pretty much like the only Nephilim introduced in the series as of right now. And uh, she is the daughter of the angel of death, Azriel. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because she kind of has some things that will be kind of brought up here. And I don't even know if uh, if I did mention this in uh, this section. But I do want to kind of bring this up. She, because of her abilities as... Uh, because of her being a Nephilim, she kind of has abilities that is kind of more similar to a Hyde agent. But she is a human. She is alive. And that's something I did want to make a note of. Uh, but she also did kind of have some training by the Hyde agency in book one. Uh, but she is very much human. She is alive. She just kind of has like these almost supernatural abilities and these gifts. Uh, because of the fact that she is a Nephilim. Walk up the stairs, Gray demanded for the tenth time as if it was such an easy concept. Elizabeth, Elizabeth's heart raced so fast she, she thought it would burst out from her chest. She stared up at the entrance of the storm shelter she was stuck in, sunlight peering through the cracks invitingly. The steps were cracked and worn, seemingly daring her to ascend. But as she looked up, all she could feel was fear. This is all because of that brute of a man, Levi Beckett. Whatever he did filled her with dread. Elizabeth believed that if she left the storm shelter, she would die. Never in her life had she felt as terrified as she was now. Flesh was beginning to drift through Elizabeth's fingertips onto this dusty concrete below. Elizabeth, Elizabeth peered around the room, eyes focusing on the dust flitting freely in the air before resting on the walls with peeling white paint. There was an old couch in the storm shelter. But she hoped was animal urine stare, uh, stained, the couch cushion, stained the couch cushions and the torn fabric exposed the yellow fa fa filling inside. I'm having a hard time reading all of a sudden. No matter how much she looked around, her eyes always returned to the staircase. A part of her run had run out, but she w felt that she was mentally and physically unable to. Go up the stairs, Greg repeated, trying to keep her mind on track. I can't. I'll die. Elizabeth's voice quivered as she spoke. No, you won't. You only think you will die. Go up the stairs. Greg was insisting and Elizabeth was compelled to obey. Elizabeth cautiously approached the staircase and her heart raised more intensely with each step. It took her a couple of minutes to work up the curse, even put a foot up on the first step. As soon as she did, though, she began to feel her heart pulsating in her chest. The thump, the thump, the thump. It took her ten minutes to climb up three more steps, but the closer she got to the door, the more afraid she was. Whatever Beckett did to her had affected her deeply. She never knew that demons had this power to be able to overwhelm someone's emotions to give them to give control of the human's body and mind to themselves. Eventually she reached the top she reached the door, gripped the handle and pushed. It wasn't locked. The door swung open away from Elizabeth's grip and she was greeted by an angry Levi Beckett looking down at her. He bared his yellow teeth and furrowed his brows in anger. Elizabeth could see a vein pulsating in his neck, but her fear was at the, at the highest it had ever been. Elizabeth panicked and ran back downstairs, and Le Levi slowly stomped down each step as if each stomp had to express his anger. Stop running, now! Levi be bellowed, causing Elizabeth to freeze in her tracks. She couldn't help but wonder how Levi's voice seemed to amplify the f this feeling of dread she was experiencing. Resist, Grace spoke up, but Elizabeth was less com left confused by the order. Turn around and look at me, Becca growled. Elizabeth obeyed and saw the same thing as the night she was taken from her home. Beckett's eyes turned black and his head emanated a dark aura. Something about that aura was what filled her with fear. As, out, as she looked around, as she looked Beckett in his eyes, a piercing ringing sound echoed in her ears. The only sound she could hear was from Beckett and his heavy breathing. Elizabeth thought back to what Grace said, and she couldn't help but wonder how she could resist this feeling. Grace's voice somehow appears through the deafening screeching. screeching. Whatever he tells you to do, try not to obey willingly. If he tells you to stay, tell yourself you will leave. Counter his influence. Counter his influence, Elizabeth thought to herself. She knew there was a demonic ability called influence, a demon's power to compel others to obey. She never knew that she would be forced to experience it this way. 
Her eyes drifted to every imperfection present in Levi's appearance. She had a stained white shirt, dirty pants, and mud covering his shoes. As she met his eyes, she saw a look of pure anger. His eyes were bloodshot, and his mouth formed a seemingly permanent scowl, and a vein in his neck was consistently bulging. A black aura enveloped Levi's head, and, and thin strands of black wisp-like tendrils. My foot is really itching. And his eyes went black as he spoke. You will stay here, or else you're dead. Elizabeth's heart began to race as she tried to apply Gray's warning. She wanted to leave. She wanted to escape captivity, but because of whatever believe I was doing, she couldn't go. Every part of her body was screaming, don't disobey him. You'll die. Another part could help but wonder. This is what a demon's influence does. It compels you to obey by planting a deep-seated fear of death. Every part of her body felt willing to submit to Levi's wishes. Her knees, her knees began to buckle as she, as she no longer felt capable of standing. Elizabeth looked up at Levi and saw his skull turning to a slight, slight smirk. He dropped a bag of food and a six-pack of water and let the storm tell her he did what he came here to do. Elizabeth struggled to her feet. Her heart still, rate still rapid as she waited until the shelter's hatch slammed shut before she began to relax. When the ringing in her ears ceased, she collapsed to the ground, exhausted. Elizabeth felt her encounter with Levi drain all her energy, leaving her a husk. She remembered feeling the same way when she was first abducted. Elizabeth fought against Levi with everything she had, but in the end, she was overpowered. She could not give so much of a scratch against that monster. The longer she stayed here, there, the more she wanted to leave. She didn't want to be imprisoned by that monster anymore. As she looked at her heart, as she looked at the hatch, her heart began to race, and she was filled once again with an overwhelming sense of dread. Gray broke the silence. A demon's influence lasts about 24 hours, but you do not have that long. The next time Levi Beckett comes down here will be to kill you. You need to either find a way to escape by then, prepare to fight back, or both. I want to leave Gray, but I don't think I can approach the stairs without having a heart attack. Wait for the effects of the influence to begin to fade. I can tell you have already resisted its, its effects as the power it has over you feels weaker. We pause for a moment as if to think. In several hours, you may be able to ascend the staircase as you did earlier. Still, in the meantime, try to learn to manipulate the light you have. I can teach you. You just need to listen. Elizabeth released a dry laugh. She knew she had a bad habit of ignoring Gray's advice. Like in high school, Gray warned her not to go to a prom with Willie Huntley. That ended up being the worst mistake of her life as he got drunk and puked on her dress. The situation was on a high school fling, and she knew she only had one choice. If she wants to survive, she needed to listen to Gray. Gray was the only ally she had right now. Elizabeth breathed in and out slowly as she stared at the hatch, expecting it to burst open. Tell me what to do. So there's one other thing I will say about this. It kind of introduces this. So far, we've been kind of introduced to like different powers. Of uh, both the hide agency and the uh, and the uh, uh, demons, we talked. I mentioned the power of flow uh, that hide agent has, and you have seen. We have discussed that the power of influence that demons have. Both demons and uh, hide agents has at least three base powers that is kind of manipulated and used by different. Uh, by different people and different uh, by uh, people differently. Uh, Hide agents uh, powers are essentially a construct, which allows them to fuse a weapon with the power of light. Uh, flow, which kind of enhances a certain like attribute uh, of the body part. Like for example, like again, like focusing light in your eyes can uh, allow a hide agent to predict the movement of an enemy, and. Uh, a breath of life, which is kind of expelling uh, the light into like a certain point or outward out outside of the body in general, and for a high agent, like combining those three powers is kind of integral to like doing like uh, pretty much like anything that a high agent can really think of. Like my idea for creating this power system is, I want it to be kind of really only limited to my imagination. And this is something I kind of brought up like in the first uh, book, but I didn't want to bring this up in this project because I didn't want to make it too complicated. Basically, 
the three powers that a high vision has when they are used together they can essentially do almost anything that a high vision can think of you can like create like a ball or a grenade that you can throw that would kind of explode and damage a demon like it's entirely an idea that i've been having as sort of like a uh, a form of like a command my way from dragon ball that's something they could in theory do as a hide agent you can uh for charlotte matthews i had the idea of like creating almost like a boxing gloves uh like around like charlotte matthews hands as you kind of use this to fight you can like do like different things uh for different uh for different situations for each of the hide agents and the same is also true for a demon like the, the abilities that a demon has is kind of meant to be a parallel of a uh what a hide agent has so for example a demon uh can use the three base powers of corruption which allows you to either fabricate a weapon out of darkness or it allows you to kind of corrupt a weapon with a with the power of darkness it's kind of meant to be like a different version of a, the high agent's uh, construct. Uh, Demon also has the ability of influence, which is kind of essentially kind of the same as uh, a high agent's flow, except for it kind of affects a, a demon can use influence differently. Like for an example, is in book one, I have a character named Zara who is a succubus, and when she uses the high, uh, the power of influence people who kind of see it are kind of more so compelled by the desire to kind of give her what she wants it's, uh, because she kind of feeds off of like the positive emotions of others and when she uses influence others will want to help her meanwhile Levi Beckett's use of influence is kind of more steeped of fear whenever he use it, uses it he fills the others uh, other people with the fear of death as if like disobeying him and what he wants will kind of is essentially like a death sentence and that's kind of the differences between what influence can do for like different people but uh it's kind of meant to be like a parallel of the version of flow the third and final base ability that demon can have is a form of shade and you've actually already kind of seen this ability in uh and uh in action already shade as base form can allow uh, uh, a demon to kind of travel from place to place by just stepping in the shadow. However, it can also have like someone who's going to master that ability can literally draw the drain the light of an entire room and kind of create like an, a room of darkness and are able to kind of like transport themselves like rapidly within total darkness and that's essentially kind of the base of, of those abilities but again like combining those abilities in different ways and enable a demon or a hide agent to kind of do just about anything that i can imagine as a writer and uh really like nothing is impossible for what a hide agent or a demon can do so long as they have mastery of those three base powers uh, but that's something I did kind of want to discuss. Like there is a power system involving light and dark and darkness, and it is kind of fairly complex. Uh, next time we we could in theory just kind of read this section, but this is kind of a long section actually. So I think we're going to be saving it for next time. Uh, we are kind of a little bit out of time here, but. Well, I kind of did what I really wanted to do at this point. Uh, one thing I will say is in the next stream, we're going to be trying to read the entire the rest of this project. And uh, Hefe, this upcoming Hefe session will introduce the third, uh, the third uh, character who... Uh, the uh, a character that will be a part of the third trilogy and uh the main character of the third trilogy and he is kind of meant to be kind of a more interesting character he is kind of more focused on the theme of forgiveness with him struggling to be able to forgive himself for his actions in the past 
And you kind of see him both in Hefe section and later on in God section. All four of these sections with Hefe, Michael, Alec Lowe, and God are actually kind of fairly long. Uh, Hefe section looks like it's about 10 pages, Michael's 8 pages. Uh, Alec Lowe looks like it is about 5 pages long. Wait. Eight pages long, and God is also a fairly long section, and it's also kind of fairly dense with information. So I do kind of want to kind of save that for next time, and next time will be the finale of this uh, project. So if you are remotely interested in what to see tonight, I will be discussing and analyzing this project for the final time next. Uh, what did I just do? I don't know. I will be discussing and analyzing this project for the final time next uh, Saturday, next Thursday, 1 p.m. to 3 Pacific Standard Time. I'm going to be streaming a 73 Pass of 1% completion on Fridays, 1 p.m. to 4 Pacific Standard Time, 1 p.m. to 5 Pacific Standard Time. And I'm going to be stream I'm going to be streaming Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories for 1% completion on Saturdays, 1 p.m. to 5 Pacific Standard Time. And I'm going to be streaming uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate for 1% completion on Friday, Sundays, 1 p.m. to 5 Pacific Standard Time. Uh, all of the games I got on my channel will be played for 1% completion, but are not only go for 1% in game statistic, but 1% in achievements as well. That's going to do for uh, today. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you all next time.